Welcome everyone. This is the third of four videos on qualitative data management. This session is about transcription procedures. In particular, this session will cover three main points, that is to say, understanding what transcriptions are and how to conduct them, examining good and bad examples of transcriptions, and considering key points about translations of transcriptions. Simply put, the transcription process takes place whenever we engage in transforming qualitative data from audio or visual recordings into text. To complicate things, and based on the school of thought I come from, transcribing is not just an objective account of recorded data, but it is a process of transformation of data from sound to text that entails making choices where we select what aspects to include or exclude from audio or video recordings, that is to say pauses, hesitation or grammar mistakes, based on whether they are relevant to the purpose of our research. And this is already a stage of interpretation where we are giving meaning to the data. We need to make these selective choices prior to starting the transcription process, and they constitute an initial stage of data interpretation. These choices may be also registered in writing when working within a team in order to ensure that all team members are on the same page and as part of the rigor of the approach. The overlap between data management and analysis in qualitative approaches constitutes a main difference from quantitative data where the data management and the data analysis processes are two separate ones. It is also important to note that even when using transcription software to support this task, the process still includes interpretation because the algorithms they are based on are designed by humans who are part of specific social contexts. Additionally, after the software has converted audio into text, there is a need for human input to check for accuracy and to edit, for example, punctuation and other bits based on the specific requirements of the research. Another aspect to consider is that our theoretical perspectives will play a role in the choices we make when transcribing, and hence we result in the transcripts being a construct of an interpretive process. A main difference exists between naturalized and denaturalized approaches. The first one employs verbatim transcriptions with symbols to capture as many details as possible to faithfully represent speech. On, on the one hand, this approach may be helpful to catch nuances of interactions with participants. On the other hand, though, excessive mention of nonverbal signals may obfuscate the meaning of participants' statements. The second one, the denaturalized approach, focuses more on the meanings within interactions and less on how ideas are said and what those meanings convey about participants' lives. It is important to note that there, isn't, there is no better or worse choice between approaches. Rather, the research question and the kind of information sought will determine the most useful approach to transcription for that specific purpose. For instance, if you're interested in how speech is used to negotiate the adoption of agroecological practices among farmers, then a naturalized approach would suit this purpose better. However, if we are interested in the meanings and perceptions related to the adoption of agroecological practices among farmers, then a denaturalized approach to transcription would be more helpful. Other considerations relate to the fact that choices about transcription may influence how the research participants are perceived, 
within a naturalized approach, for instance, maintaining non-standard English expressions may reveal the ethnicity, age group and socioeconomic backgrounds of participants, and this at times can influence how analysts perceive participants. As a consequence, the analysis of data from interviews may be subject to prejudices. An example could be developing assumptions on the laziness of some research participants due to their ethnic and sociocultural backgrounds, which can adversely affect intervention programs designed for them based on the results of the research study. At the same time, maintaining these nuances in speech may help have socioculturally rich data that could improve the outcomes of the research. In this case, interventions may be designed in a more relevant way to participants' features and needs. An example could be choosing to include content in social programs interventions that is more culturally relevant to the participants and hence enhances participation, their participation and engagement. An important step in this process is to stop and reflect about the transcription choices we make. To help us choose what approach would better serve the participants, we could also ask ourselves how the participants themselves would transcribe their own speech. For instance, for my doctoral research in Jamaica, I chose to keep the spelling of Jamaican Patois words in most instances because I knew that participants use that same spelling when they text uh, on WhatsApp on a daily basis, for instance. Another helpful aspect would be for the interviewer to make non-verbal signals or involuntary vocalizations clearer for the transcriber. For instance, a sniff or a laugh in an audio recording may be confusing and interpreted respectively as a cry or a laugh, when instead they may indicate the participant just having a cold or a nervous laugh. As we will see later, we will make different choices based on whether we are the transcriber or someone else's. The method of analysis that we will use will influence the choices we make about the type of transcription we choose to use. For instance, if you use conversation analysis, you will need more detailed transcription on elements of conversation. Whereas if you use content analysis, those will matter because you will be more focused on the themes and meanings that are contained within the interaction. Both in the case that we carry out transcriptions and when there is an external transcriber, it is preferable to follow the same ethical and data protection guidelines. This aspect needs to be agreed on at the beginning when employing external transcribers in order to be on the same page. It is important to check that we have enough space to store the audio and video files on our devices and that we have agreed on a safe sharing method with our transcriber or transcribers in order to ensure a smooth process. We need to plan our transcription time based on the chosen method of analysis for instance, uh, verbatim transcriptions can take three hours per each hour of talk. And some factors that can affect the amount of time needed are whether the recordings involve individual interviews or focus group discussions, uh, sound quality, participants' clarity of speech, hour or the transcriber's typing speed, and so on. Earlier, using a foot pedal was a common practice. Nowadays, though, computer software like Media Player or Audacity make the task of playing and pausing the audio recording while transcribing much easier. The transcription process can be combined with a transcription software such as Xprescribe, um, OtterEye or Trint and the question remains on whether there is any software available that includes local languages. Some software have helpful features that help improve the sound quality by removing background noise. This can be particularly helpful in case you are conducting interviews in a location where you cannot make changes to the background. 
For instance, in my case, I was once conducting an interview during the rainy season in Jamaica and the noise of the heavy rain almost completely covered the interviewee's voice in the recording. And in that case, I didn't have access to sound quality improving features and I had to rely on the handwritten notes that I had taken during the interview. It is helpful to also combine the transcripts from audio recordings with notes about participants' body language, their tone, expressions, or other relevant and non-verbal elements, as well as what occurred in the surroundings in order to build a richer picture for our data analysis. It is important to set up our workstation ergonomically as transcriptions will take hours of work and to take breaks in between. Using line numbers in our word processing software can help easily refer to parts of the transcripts and using a rich text format can simplify importing files in data analysis software. Taking these steps can help better manage your qualitative data for a smooth transition between different stages of the process of analysis. We need to determine the availability of the budget prior to sending recordings to the transcriber and check charging methods, for instance, per recorded minute or hour, or by the time taken to transcribe. We need to discuss all the costs involved with the transcribers, such as uh, VAT, supplementary charges, and when they are applied and so on. And it would also be prudent to ask them to sign a confidentiality agreement. Uh, we need to determine whether small talks at the beginning of interviews need to be transcribed and check the quality of one finished transcript before sending them more. Also, using a transcribing log, that is to say a record with a list of all the interviews conducted where you, you keep track of those that have been transcribed and those that still need transcribing, where you can check your own transcription pro progress or what has been completed by and also paid to the transcriber in order to easily manage and keep track of the recordings and your budget. It is also important to provide transcribers with instructions related to the purpose of the research and transcriptions requirements. The research aims will also determine the level of detail needed, for instance, whether to transcribe nonverbal aspects, involuntary vocalizations, details of poses, and so on. We can choose whether to use uh, standardized transcription symbols, for instance, uh, the one developed by Jefferson um, can be helpful based this this choice is based again uh, on our research aims and focus we can use specific formats in transcriptions based on analysis software used or not or archiving needs it is also helpful to have a glossary of frequently used terms uh, that are used in the interviews and that are not in everyday common use and how to transcribe them. We need to compile all the information and share it with the transcriber and then double check the accuracy and quality of the transcripts. And in this image, uh, we can see an example of a list of symbols made um, on the system device by Jefferson, although there are different variations that can be found online from the same system. We can see, for instance, that um, when there are pauses, uh, they can be indicated by a dot within brackets, or we can indicate the number of seconds that the pause lasts and um, many other. 
It is also important to note, and we will see this in a following example, that we can adapt these symbols um, to our preferences. Whether the interviewer is also the transcriber or they hire an external one, it is good practice to first transcribe audio files in the original language and then translate them into another target language if needed. We need to consider whether a high level of accuracy of transcript, for instance, vernacular expressions, may expose participants' identities or encourage negative perceptions towards them. Moreover, we should always remember to anonymize participants in transcripts and develop a protocol to refer to them with participant IDs linked to their actual names that are stored separately and securely in a document that contains a list of the research participants. Solutions related to having a good protocol to protect participants' identities can be discussed in a separate seminar though. Accuracies related to aspects of speech such as speed, tone, emphasis, and so on can affect uh, data interpretation. Here we can see an example of two different ways of transcribing the same interview. These are three short extracts from an online interview, which we will look at separately in the following slides. The context was a semi-structured interview about the role of the interviewee coordinating and their lessons and insights from their experience working within pharma research networks in three different regions, that is to say the Andes, West, South and East Africa. By just looking at it, can you tell which one may be wrong and what is wrong with it? The one on the left, at a first look, appears just as an extract of text that does not contain any symbol to indicate how the utterance occur occurred. There is no punctuation or indication of pauses and other speech signals. You cannot visually recognize who is asking a question and who is answering it. I cannot even tell which part of the text belongs to the interviewer and which one to the interviewee. There are no indications of overlapping speech, pauses or emphasis in speech or of nonverbal activities. In this simple example, we can see an extract from an interview where the interviewee is anonymized and indicated with a coded ID. It simply stands for female respondent and then an assigned identification number uh, that is 01. The researcher is indicated as I for interviewer. And um, had there been more than one researchers in the team, I would have probably used the researcher's name to distinguish them. Here we can listen to the first part of the transcription excerpt from the previous slide. Thank you so much. And because you mentioned the differences um, on the top of your head, what, what are the striking differences that come to mind if you think of the different regions? Oh, that's OK. So you can choose the aspects that you want to focus on. Yeah, it's um, this is just from my perspective and it's very general, but I would say um, one difference is is kind of the role of different organizations in the regions is slightly different in west africa they have a lot of very strong farmer organizations and the farmer organizations uh, or farmer federations in some cases are mm. quite central to and have become more and more so um to the farmer research networks and so they are able to kind of use their um I want to call it maybe social capital, but anyways, they use their connections with farmers in many different regions and many different farmers um, to uh, create a large network of farmers and uh, that can be doing um, this, the, this work that could be part of an FRN, for example. And um, 
obviously d- there's differences in crops, in farming techniques, in climate, in uh, you know soils. Uh, there's you know there's many 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 other differences. Um, in East and Southern Africa, NGOs are often the organizations that are more central to um, the development of an FRN. Um, could be an NGO or a, a, a civil society organization or community based mm-hmm. organization. And then um, in the Andes, it's kind of a mix. Uh, and I think, you know, the interesting thing is the Andes is just the depth of, of uh, experience and um, his history with participatory me- methods. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a long history of emancipatory movements and um, farmer centered uh, research and practice, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, uh, they're just each region has its own sort of specificities and its own strengths really. This clutch from the first part on the right side shows some use of the symbols developed by Jefferson, which are highlighted such as the square brackets to indicate overlapping speech of the interviewer and interviewee, the three dots to indicate a short pause, and in the end, we can also see the use of the column symbol to indicate a longer vowel pronounced by the speaker on the word uh, long to indicate an emphasis on the length of time uh, the emancipatory movements have existed in the Andes region. You can also note that I didn't follow exactly the symbols provided in the list by Jefferson, and I instead adapted them to my preference. For instance, for short pauses, I didn't use brackets to enclose the dots or the exact number of seconds that the pause lasted. In my view, this helped to improve the reading fluency of the transcript. This choice also indicates that the transcription symbols can be used as guidelines, but can also be adapted to our needs. The important thing is that when working within a research team, we inform other team members about the meaning of the symbols we used in order to ensure accuracy and rigor in the analysis of the data. Here, we can listen to the second part of the interview extract that we saw in slide 12. Super details. (laughs) That's a really hard question. Well, I mean, I think in West Africa, this uh, a strength is just the number of farmers that they can reach quite um, with with the kinds of infrastructures and organizations that they have um, can reach a lot of farmers uh, quite effectively. Um, so that certainly is one. Um, I, I, it, and and it's you know the thing is it varies a lot by project. That's that's mm-hmm. the other thing. It, In this second excerpt from the interview transcription of the audio, we can notice the text enclosed within double brackets to indicate a non-verbal activity, such as laughing. The notation of body language can change the meaning of the interaction. For instance, the omission of the laugh may make the statement sound serious and the humor in it may be missed. Here, we can listen to the third part of the interview extract that we saw in slide 12. Wanting to bring in also farmer's knowledge, like that's the important thing, I think, is that you, you're, uh-huh. you're also, hopefully, I think most of the FRNs really are um, uh, paying attention to farmer knowledge and to local knowledge and to different forms of it, as sometimes traditional or indigenous knowledge as well. In this short extract of transcripts from the third part of the interview, on the right side, we can notice the underlined text where the interviewee stressed the concept that they were expressing, which is highlighted in blue. Having an indication of what the participant emphasized is helpful for data interpretation and also in order to convey the tone with which a statement is made, 
which can alter its meaning. With regards to translations, translators and translations are needed when the target language is different from the participant's language. We should budget uh, extra time for translation by considering an average of 10 translated pages per person daily. And the translator's experience can help them include cultural meanings besides literal translations. And greater understanding of the linguistic and social context within which things are said can help arrive at a translated meaning that is equivalent to what was said in the original language and contextually accurate. Translation two is interpretation, first through the process of verbatim transcription and then through the process of translating into target language um, where we interpret the data and make analytical decisions. Using the Bristlin's translation model by employing two bilingual translators with familiarity with the research area can help the precision of the translation. The first translator translates from the original into the target language and the second one translates back into the original language. Then they check for correspondence between the two texts and negotiate on the differences. This is a list of useful resources to explore some of the points covered in this session in more detail. In case you're interested, the slides for this presentation, as well as lots more resources, can be downloaded from our website at statsforsd.org resources. Thank you very much.